Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Dual Hearts, and guess what? It's boss time. Or perhaps, I should say, it's pre-boss cutscene time. It's time to figure out what uh, Gregor's been hiding down at the bottom of his subconscious. Now, that's new. Usually we reappear, you know, right in the middle of the boss arena, but now we're in the crow's nest of Gregor's ship, possibly. Kind of a uh, lame for a legendary pirate, I should say. Note that uh, Gregor is using the same texture that he uses after he washed up ashore, which means that he apparently wears the bandages that he got when he was injured as a fashion accessory when he's perfectly fine. Pirate King's treasure, it's in red, which means it must be important, and by that I mean we will never actually find out what it is. I guess this is supposed to be the story, you know, of how Gregor busted up a ship and washed ashore, which is a little bit unusual, because I can't imagine this would be, you know, the thing that he would be hiding down deep down inside, you know, it's not really nearly as big of a secret as, like, his entire life as a bloodthirsty pirate, I'd imagine. Also, check it out, the guys in the back I think are wearing the same hats that the Dream Researchers wore, more or less. Anyway, here we go. Time to meet, uh, Gregor's nemesis, so to speak, and our boss. I guess, from my perspective, it would be kind of funny if Gregor actually sort of ran aground of a rock by accident, and this is just something that he made up inside to make inside his brain to make himself look better. But uh, we'll go with it for now, because we have no real reason about him. Oh man, there he goes. Bumble's making the freaked out face. I love it. Ship goes the other way. It's like an episode of Star Trek. Ship rocks and they go flying. So does Gregor, but he'll be fine, because it's all in his mind. Probably. Anyway... Now for the real boss fight, more or less, in case it wasn't obvious, from the tentacles encircling the ship. Any minute now. There we go. Yes, there it is. Our boss is the Kraken. All jokes aside, all memes aside. It's actually a pretty interesting interpretation of, you know, a squid monster. It's kind of like a ghost squid thing. Pretty cool to fight. Pretty intimidating looking as bosses go in this game compared to, you know, the giant snowman and... It's the statue eyeball night guy. Anyway, the weapons we want here are the spear and the lightning draw card. He is weak to lightning, and the majority of the other weapons don't really hit him all that well from the areas you're actually allowed to stand on these three little rafts. He'll sort of just hang out on one until he knocks it up in the air like that, and then you'll hit him. It takes one hit to dispel, uh, three hits rather, to dispel the shield that he has, and then after that, you get a number of free hits on him. Naturally, since we have level, the level 4 spear and his elemental weakness, our attacks do a ton of damage. After that, he'll sink to the bottom, and you have a short opportunity to dash into him with Bumble, but this doesn't really do all that much damage, and you only get a couple of tries to do it. Again, I think we sort of threw things out of whack, considering... Oh, and we also get stuck on, this, on the, the ocean floor, which is a little bit unfortunate. While we're down here, there's one extra cavern that we can explore, which is important because it contains the last 15 rings, or in this case... 15 of the last 16 since I missed one in the main part of the level. While you're down here, he'll attack you with ink blots and he'll try to dash into you, but again, like most enemies in this game, he's not unusually aggressive, so you can just sort of dash with Bumble and he won't really hit you. He doesn't home, he just dashes straight, so you really have to try to actually take damage from this guy. These rings will put us up over 1300, which is a nice milestone, although of course we're missing a bunch of rings in nearly every dream we visited since our last 100% completion run after we got the ability to fly, so no matter what, we've got some work ahead of us. Anyway, we return back to the platforms. Sometimes, and I haven't really puzzled this out, he will return back into the ocean several times after you dodge him once. I haven't really figured out why he does this. He's really supposed to sort of... I guess his AI script gets locked up a little bit. Eventually, he'll stabilize under one platform after we dodge his attack, and then we'll be able to resume killing him like we have been previously. Any day now. Come on. It, usually, it helps a lot to be on Bumble, except when you're actually trying to hit him, just because it's the easiest way to go from one platform to the next without having to jump. Unfortunately, that little rotating attack that he does, it's very difficult to actually hit him to dispel the shield, and still have time to jump over his tentacles, so I usually have to take a hit. But we do so much damage to him that it matters very little. I believe it's supposed to take five or six iterations to actually kill him, but for whatever reason, it takes us exactly 
three plus this little extra where he has no real health left, but for some reason he takes still two or three more hits from the spear, which is pretty weird. I think it throws sort of the planned algorithm for how many times it was supposed to take us to do this, considering that we were using, you know, his weakness and a souped-up spear. Oh man, that's why the ship sunk. He put the anchor in the treasure chest again. Man, someone's got egg on his face. Or they would if he wasn't dead at the bottom of the ocean. Oh man, how unfortunate. Momo doesn't care. He's got a chocolate coin to eat. I do like that they bothered to program the little splash from him doing his little happy dance while he was swimming. He can do the doggy paddle. Yep, his buck got stronger. Awesome. Anyway, over to the other side of the this little ocean mini-map, where we can pick up the tummy up fragment, the HP up fragment, and the ninth and final key. Let's get these, this will give us 14 HP in total. I hate to spoil things, but it is pretty obvious by now that we actually don't top out at 20 HP, even though that seems to be what the meter maxes out as. There's our red key, we'll open up the gate out of the level, and we can go. Let's go pick up that ninth orb after whatever cutscenes resolve Gregor's specific dilemma. See what sort of character, what amazing character development we're beholden to now that we've completed the seventh key dream. The analogies between Gregor and Stompy are intended to be extremely obvious, especially considering that much like Stompy, who was seeking the Dreamstone, Gregor was seeking this legendary Pirate King's treasure, which was apparently the Pirate King's anchor or something. I mean, it was a little odd, because the treasure chest was already on the ship, and ostensibly Gregor was searching for it. But actually opening the treasure chest, I suppose, leads to some blunt development about, you know, treasures that are more important than money. Gregor's apparently dropped the ladder. Remember that after he had his little pouty fit and moved into his cave, he retracted the ladder, meaning we had to go through Emma's dream to get into his dream in the first place. Let's go pull out that anchor. We got the Pirate King's treasure for ourselves. But, ah, uh, Apparently Gregor had his final change of heart as we were leaving the dream itself. Ha, ah, Stompy's thinking eyes. Unfortunately, in case it happens to be difficult to see on the little YouTube screen, that is a picture of Emma. I don't mean to spoil it since it should be pretty obvious in the overall character development. Anyway, back to the Dream Temple. There's nothing to do, there's no completion since we didn't pick up any items or any interesting abilities for Bumble. So let's go straight to the Red Treasure Chamber and solve the ninth and final Hall of Trials, you know, including the two that Bumble did on his own somehow. Here we go. This is another one of the elemental themed puzzles based on the, you know, the correspondence between general elements and the, the color of the room. It's a fire puzzle, these little dragon statues in the corners of the room. This puzzle was sort of descended from an original puzzle from Alundra, you know, the game that this is the spiritual sequel to, except significantly easier. The one from Alundra requires sort of pixel-perfect motion, since it was a 2D game with very precise hitboxes for everything. This is much more general. In fact, you can even let it hit you as you lead it over to this torch. It moves and fits and starts, and it will die if it hits one of the columns, but it isn't too difficult to dodge. The first one is, as usual, extremely straightforward. All we have to do is move from one side of the room to the other. The second one, of course, we have to navigate this little maze. Again, thankfully, someone had the foresight to make sure... Okay, it's a little unfortunate, because if you're not standing in the exact right position, the very first little fireball will hit directly into the wall, so you kind of have to be standing over a little bit of an angle. See? There we go. I have to go a little bit off. It took me a while to figure out. It's very aggravating. Plus, it tends to go in whatever direction you're facing. There we go. You have to be facing, sort of way into the corner. And you can just sort of lead it around. So you go. As aggravating as it looks to have to sort of dodge around the corners through these little columns, there isn't anything particularly difficult once you get it out of that first little alcove. Uh, this is, in fact, not a second take or anything. I did this on my first try. Sort of indicating that since I'm terrible at video games, as you've seen from watching me solve the previous puzzles in Gregor's Dream, that it isn't as difficult as it looks. And it doesn't look very hard to begin with. Now, well, let's repeat ad nauseum. This is apparently ice, but it doesn't actually seem to have ice physics on the floor, which is extremely fortunate. Otherwise, this would be incredibly annoying. This is basically the same puzzle, but with n equals 4. So, let's take care of the first one. Do it one by one, one in each corner. There we go. I feel like a cheerleader doing commentary while uh, 
watching myself play a video game from about two months in the past. Oh man, spoiler alert, I wonder if I make it. I don't know what the, uh, the, uh, puzzle failed noise we keep getting is, the little, little buzzer that keeps going off. I might be trying to change the camera up and down. This is not an ideal angle when the fire is trailing you, since you can't really see it from far up above while you're trying to direct it sufficiently past all the walls. Anyway, after a certain period of time, of course, it's four torches, and that is three puzzle rooms solved. So let's collect our item and see what we can do with it. Although, to be frank, since there's only one obstacle we run into the remainder of our time here, and uh, I should say, the other dungeons that we visited that we can interact with, it should be pretty obvious what we're actually getting. Remember all those purple obelisks that we saw scattered around various levels? Pretty much exactly one per level that we haven't already achieved 100% completion in. Yep, we've gotten the red orb, and it turns into the gauntlet. So, let's escape the room and allow the sheep a little time to stalk us, as he usually does. Do we want a tutorial? No, I do not believe we need a tutorial in the end game. I'm pretty sure we can figure out how to walk up to something and press the contact sensitive button when necessary. But you never know, I could be wrong. Granted, we were using those tutorials basically solely to get 100% completion in the sheep stream, and now we have it. So let's uh, cut back to the bridge outside the red treasure room. Let's not bother skipping through the, entr the entryway, because this is where our next cutscene is. Gee, I wonder what happens. We've got all the orbs and all the keys. Might be some Dreamstone might be some kind of orb. Huh, what could possibly go wrong? It's exactly what the evil possessed queen told you to do. But still, since we are good little soldiers and good little RPG protagonists, let's go do exactly what we need to do to release the ancient evil so that we can fix it after breaking it, of course. I always thought that he kept the nine orbs in the little ring around his belt. That was why I assumed it was sort of glowing rainbow when he's in the dream world, but apparently I was wrong. He keeps them... I don't know, in his bra or something. Beats the heck out of me. Yep, go figure. In they go. Note that the little 100 dream orbs teleporter disappeared off the top of that obelisk for the purpose of this cutscene. Of course, as it turns out, that was a hole. We could walk over to it, but... I don't know. Brilliant! <laughs> I mean, we've been in every other room. Where, what else could be in there? Sorry, I love Bumble's freaked out face. Sort of. I know this is supposed to be a really grave and serious scene, but it's very hard to take it seriously when he's bugged out like that. This, by the way, of course, explains uh, basically the motivation behind whatever possessed the queen. Its spirit got out, but its body is still sealed underneath the nine orbs, or I should say underneath this dream temple by the power of the nine orbs, apparently. And we broke it! Fantastic. The game definitely descends from Ocarina of Time to a certain extent, and that, that thing that you're doing the entire first portion of the game did nothing but actually unleash the game's primary villain. Man, just made the last down payment on that shed. How convenient. I'm sure she will have exactly enough power to return to her body, and exactly as much time as it takes for us to get to the final wash chamber in the first place. Not sure why she's bothering to do this. I mean, you'd think that the queen of the dream world would have more life energy than she'd ever need compared to some dude from the real world. Oops. For once, it worked out for us that Val was always about a step behind us. But this does set the scene for pretty much what I'm sure the majority of you were expecting after we started the game here and failed to acquire more than a quarter of the collectibles from Val's Dream, we finally got our, our opportunity to
to return to her dreamscape and return to where this all began. Wow, check out his pendant. It is extremely red. I'm sure it was nothing important. I mean, nobody else we've ever been exploring within their subconscious has ever been in real danger. Or maybe not. This is kind of sad that the, the worst thing that would happen if Val actually died was that the inn would fail to run properly. In any case, now that we've uh, gotten our nine keys and seen this last cutscene, it's time to enter Val's dream for the last time. And I will see you tomorrow on the next episode of Let's Play Duel Hearts.